Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome to Balance, where we weekly talk about the importance of balancing our bodies, our minds, our spirits, and our communities. I'm John, and today our guest is psychologist Liz Ibanez. Welcome to Balance. Well, good afternoon, viewers. Welcome back to our episodes that we're calling Emotional Balance, and it's so cool to see how they're relating to each other. We first talked about sleep a couple weeks ago, and then last week we talked about self-talk, and today we're going to talk about the difference between guilt and shame, and it's pretty interesting that our self-talk can actually lead to some of those emotions. And so we have back with us today Dr. Liz Abanez to help us with this conversation. Thanks, Liz, for joining us today. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. It's always great to see you. Yeah, this is good fun. We get to talk about some uh, interesting topics, but in enjoy it while we're doing it. Uh, viewers, you may remember from in January where Liz was with us and we talked about guilt and we sort of had to cut that off a little bit. It's like we've, we've got some more to talk about. So we're back to talk about this again and to help make the difference, help us to see the difference a little better between what guilt is and what shame is and how that uh, impacts us, how it affects us. And one thing we're clear on and that Liz will help us be even more clear on is that all of this is sort of a continuum uh, that we may find ourselves at uh, in emotionally and how we respond, you know, how our emotions affect us. So Liz, before we start sh showing some uh, slides and, and thoughts here, Help us with that a little bit about the continuum of emotions that we deal with. Yes, thank you for asking that. So think about it as you know a rainbow of emotions. And just like we have different shades of red and blue and purple, right? We have different shades of emotions and depending on their intensities. And so an easy example is that emotion of anger, right? We can go down the color continuum and, you know, at the lighter pink side would be feelings of annoyance, uh, frustration. And then we start moving darker into that, you know, deeper red is, is feeling mad, feeling angry. And then an even more intense red is feelings of uh, furious. And then the deepest right intensity of, of red would be rage. And so that's a nice illustration of how we have different shades of emotion. And, and that's similar when we'll talk about guilt and shame today. Okay. Yeah, I think that's helpful to see that correlation. And we probably better understand that uh, description of anger. So as we talk about guilt and shame today, uh, hopefully that'll help all of us. Uh, viewers, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And uh, you now we're talking about shame and guilt today and understanding the difference of that. So uh, a lot of what Liz is sharing with us today comes from some uh, research and some uh, writings from uh, June Tagney, who's at George Mason University. And this first thought uh, is an illustration, I think, Liz, of a continuum when it comes to guilt and shame. And this says that guilt goes with empathy and shame goes with anger. Can you flesh that out for us a little bit? Mm -hmm. Sure. And, you know, we can think about it even in our everyday experiences also during childhood and, and later on as an adult, you know, guilt is a corrective emotion, right? If we're feeling guilty about something, it might be because we believe we've wronged someone or we did something wrong. And if we feel guilty, then we can also um, try to, to empathize and sympathize on, well, how did our behavior make someone else feel, right? You know, mm. say you're sorry because you hurt someone's feelings, right? And yeah. so guilt, you know, in proportion, right? We talked about that last time, making sure yeah. we don't go too far over that and, and that it's excessive guilt. But right, guilt in proportion can be helpful to show sympathy, empathy, and understand how our behavior might have affected someone else and then try to make amends for that, mm -hmm. okay? On the other hand, shame um, can, 
can be a much more debilitating emotion because shame is much more internalized than as a global sense of I'm bad, right? Versus, yeah. you know, I did something bad, right? Or, you know, I'm defective or I'm worthless or I'm not deserving. And so guilt isn't as corrective or as helpful mm. perhaps as mm. staying on the lighter shade, right? Of, of yeah. Guilt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. And back to the thought here about empathy and anger and certainly empathy is corrective and more healthy mm -hmm. and not as debilitating potentially as anger right mm -hmm. oh, thank you for for yes bringing it back also to that emotion of anger and yeah. correct me if i'm wrong or, or you can also tell me what you think but mm -hmm. sometimes we automatically believe that anger is that outward lashing out and yeah. when feeling ashamed that might happen right we become defensive and mm -hmm. might want to then, you know, our, our guard is up, right? Our protective gear, our armor is on. And so instead of being able to take responsibility or apologize or sympathize, empathize, right? We might lash out with defensiveness. You know, our mm -hmm. ego's been hurt, we're, we're wounded. So, you know, we, we need to protect or lash out. Um, so yeah. that's where shame can lead to, you know, outward anger. But sometimes we also forget to notice inward anger because that one's harder to see. So yep. oftentimes people that have excessive shame might turn that anger, anger inwardly, yeah. um, you know, maybe through self-sabotaging behaviors, unhealthy behaviors, um, you know, like addiction or cutting, you know, so anger that can be both outwardly expressed and inwardly expressed. And, and that's yeah. more likely to happen um, with excessive shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I want to look at the next slide and show some research that uh, Professor Tagney did. And this particular research was with students. And she followed her and her um, compadres, <laughs> I followed 550 students and parents from fifth grade. And they, they uh, worked with them as fifth graders and as eighth graders. And then again, on a third time at the age of 18. And so what you see here on the screen is if they were prone to shame or uh, versus prone to feeling guilt, what their behavior, how their behaviors played out. So if they were more prone to shame, they were more likely to have unsafe sex, drink at a younger age, and less likely to apply to college. So pretty much the opposite happened if they were per, uh, more prone to feeling guilt, they were less likely to do some of these things, more likely at the bottom, more likely to practice safe sex. So as you see that, Liz, um, that, that seems to go along with this continuum that we're talking about. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, think about it going back to emotions that are productive versus not, mm -hmm. you know, helpful versus versus unhelpful. So, you know, that the students who had some helpful guilt, productive guilt, right, those were the ones that were more likely to be rule abiding um, and, and have even a higher self-esteem. One of the side effects of, of excessive shame can be really affecting your self-esteem, feelings of unworthiness. Um, and therefore, you're more likely to believe, well, you know, why bother? Or, you know, I can't do that, or I don't deserve that. Um, versus guilt in proportion right, can help right. you to um, maybe take less or be less risk taking when it comes mm. to drugs, alcohol, et cetera. That's a great differentiation uh, as far as risk, what you're willing to do and maybe why you're willing to do it. Right. Yeah. So on the next slide, viewers, we have a different research that uh, Professor Tagney and her team did. So that uh, previous one was with students, so adolescents. And now uh, she's done some work with uh, inmates in a detention center. And you see some illustrations of shame prone versus guilt prone and their tendencies. And it, it sort of plays out the same way here, right? Liz, mm -hmm. those who are shame prone, uh, they're just more aggressive and can tend to take more risk. Yeah, and keep it in mind if that sense of shame is being internalized, you know, if that aggression is turned inwardly towards self or outwardly towards others. 
Yeah. Um, and even if you think about our system of um, taking responsibility, remote, you know, one of the determining factors, uh, did they show remorse? And guilt mm -hmm. and remorse mm -hmm. tend to go together. Right. So if you're feeling guilty, you might be more remorseful, which then can become a protective emotion. Nice. Um, and exactly. Versus shame, then well, well, what do I do with that? <laughs> and so um, that's an example how that could then later on cause harm or individuals to engage in criminal like activity versus then more that reparative preventative approach. Yeah. So when a client comes to you and you recognize that they're dealing with, um, you know, more shame, internal uh, pronations versus guilt, uh, I'm sure that's interesting for you to recognize that. And then, of course, that helps you, right, to know how to move forward in working with them. This quote here from uh, Professor Tagney says, in order to help with this, that we should target moral emotions for change and action. So give us a little more detail there, what that means, target moral emotions. Well, and keeping in mind um, for all of us, in order to be able to process an emotion, we have to be able to label it, um, identify it, label it, verbalize it, process through it, understand um, the triggers, and, and then decide, well, now what do I do with it? Um, so in, in therapy, sometimes clients or patients will come and say, you know, I feel guilt or I feel shame. Other times that might be part of the process of helping them put a label to that or even be intuitive to pick up on signs where an individual might be feeling shame. Um, and so that will have to do with their self-talk as last week, uh, you had a great segment with Laura Johnson, one of our counselors talking about how a situation can trigger then an interpretation or thought that triggers an emotion that then triggers a behavior. And it can yeah. go the other way around too, right? Behavior can trigger emotion that can trigger thought that can lead to another situation. So, um, so I encourage viewers to also refer back to the self-talk. Um, but sometimes we'll pick up on that on listening to how a person describes themselves, you know, what you tell yourself about yourself um, yeah. can also give some insight into how deeply ingrained those feelings of shame are and then how that's being manifested outward. Yeah. I'm curious if uh, you, you and I did talk about this, so this is off the cuff. But I'm curious if you have references maybe to writings or books or blogs or anything like that, that if this is prompting someone to say, I want to read more about this, do you have some thoughts off the top of your head about things that they could uh, look into? Mm -hmm. Well, John, that would depend on context. For example, um, unfortunately, one of the unhelpful ways that shame can be manifested itself is with different victims of abuse, for example. So I, I think I'm going to be cautious to give a, a general reference, you know, yeah. on shame or guilt, because it can really be context or situationally specific. Um, so I encourage, you know, viewers to look more so, is there a context that's triggering the guilt, such as, or shame? You know, is it shame related to maybe a victimization that they themselves have experienced? Um, okay. Because unfortunately, that's where shame can backfire and be misplaced um, or excessive. If, you know, you've been a victim or been victimized. And so depending on that, what type of victimization, whether it be physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, a victim of, of a, a different type of violent crime. So that's where, you know, I, I would encourage you to look at it by context. Um, shame related to alcoholism or drug abuse, um, that would apply. That's really helpful because uh, in, the, in the Google world we live in, you know, people want to go help themselves. Uh -huh. And so that's really helpful to know, uh, you know, if you do want to search it out for yourself uh, to think along those lines or viewers, uh, I would, I think Liz and I both would encourage you if this is so ingrained in you and, and you're struggling with either the differences or 
as Liz said, you know, putting a label on it. And that's why our counselors are here to help you work through those things. And Liz, this, this was really good. And you've actually prompted me for another thought for another episode. We'll oh, talk boy. about that. <laughs> but <laughs> we got to stop doing this. Or, or should we keep doing it? I don't know. What's the answer there? No, these are great. <laughs> and I hope that it's also helpful to the community at large. So yes, you can keep on generating your ideas. And we'll have to <laughs> this get is great. To so thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Uh -huh. Viewers, again, thanks for tuning into this. Uh, we're, we're doing our best to do this kind of uh, content, content for you, provide it for you that is helpful to you, but also helps you to know if there's some things popping up that uh, we can help you with, please contact us uh, in the office and let us know that uh, you, you would like to connect with people like Liz or any of our counselors. Thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you next week for our final episode. And next week we have a guest who's going to talk about burnout. And so that'll be our final episode about emotional balance. We hope you'll tune in next Wednesday at noon. Have a great afternoon.